What I'm going to do, Jeffrey, it's so much better for you to explain um, and give a little brief outline of what is Hive Cell than me to our listeners. So, uh, Jeffrey, take the floor. Just introduce yourself for me and just uh, introduce a little bit about Hive Cell. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, thanks for making time for me. And I'm very glad to be able to make time for you. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Ricker. I'm the co founder and CEO of Hive Cell. And Hive Cell is an edge as a service company. As a I think we're the first edge as a service company. Mm -hmm. uh, edge computing um, has taken the market by storm. It's now a top priority for most Fortune 500 companies. And it's really quite simple. It's, there was this dawning realization uh, that not all software is going to be able to run in the cloud, which is a real bummer uh, because cloud makes software so much easier to manage both for the customer and for the software vendor. So this horrifying realization that we can't do everything in the cloud is something that everyone was spent scram since scrambling to solve for. Mm -hmm. uh, we had anticipated it. We had seen it coming and had built a solution for it. And that's exactly what we address. We address how do you deploy software on-prem at hundreds or thousands of locations and make it as close to cloud-like experience for the software developer and the customer as you can. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit, Jeffrey, about for those, we've got quite a range of um, positions and people that watch and listen to our podcast. Tell us a little bit, a brief kind of summary. What is edge computing? Well, it's the ability to run, simply it's running software outside the data closet, the data center or the cloud. Mm -hmm. It's running software in a thousand retail locations or in a hundred oil uh, fields or on a hundred ships at sea or on the factory floor um, or in warehouses. It's, it's out there. It's where the data is. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is there's been a, um, a tide shift. Um, up till about two years ago, more and more data was being generated in the cloud and being pushed out to the edge, out to the cell phones, out to the homes, out to the offices. So the majority of the data was, was generated in the cloud and being sent to the edge. Now, um, just as a tide shifts, one minute the tide is coming in and the next minute the tide's going out, we're there. Now the majority of the data is being generated at the edge outside the cloud and needs to be pushed to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And this is mainly being driven by the internet of things, IOT um, and machine learning. And really what you've seen is there is this brand new source of data, IoT, huge amount of data, much more than we ever anticipated. And then there's machine learning, this brand new way to extract data from that data source. And these two things have collided like a nuclear reaction. And they've released two things. One is this whole new way of innovating business, to finding innovation, uh, to finding uh, increased efficiencies in operations and customer satisfaction. Mm -hmm. But it's also released this demand for edge computing. So that's the explosion we're seeing. There's the cause and here's the release. Mm -hmm. Interesting. How did, so obviously you were saying at the beginning there that you kind of anticipated um, its growth, it anticipated the need of edge computing. How did Hive Cell come to that point where they knew edge computing was going to be the next big thing? Well, we, we were first involved with helping companies adopt distributed computing. Um, that is software that's designed by nature to run on multiple machines. Mm -hmm. And we realized that there was this revolution that had occurred in software, um, starting with Hadoop, with big data, but then being uh, followed by every other major uh, software event after that. Uh, mm -hmm. Kubernetes, Kafka, all the other buzzwords that you're hearing. And the hardware industry had completely ignored it. Um, they had just keep building hardware as if nothing had changed. So up until Hadoop, the only way to scale software was to put it on a bigger box, mm -hmm. right? If, you, if your software got needed more memory, more disk space, more CPU power, you needed a bigger and bigger box. 
And so companies made bigger and bigger boxes. But most applications didn't need all that compute power. In fact, it was way overkill. So VMware made billions taking those oversized boxes and making them look like little boxes that were actually the size that your software needed, those virtual machines. And then we have this revolution of distributed computing. And distributed computing makes several small computers act as if they're one big computer. You can now scale an application by adding more and more servers. And then we end up with this insanity. We have these big boxes that we make look like little boxes, and then we run applications on top of it that make the little boxes look like one big box. Mm -hmm. It's insane. Mm -hmm. Why not make small servers to begin with? Servers that are the size necessary for modern computing. And then when you realized that we were working with that, and then you realize this tide change that you're not going to be able to process all this data in the cloud that you're going to have to push the compute out to the source of the data. Mm -hmm. That's that's where we solve for. Interesting, absolutely interesting. So where where are the benefits in using edge computing? Where are the benefits and who should be kind of taking these benefits now? Who should be going to this? Well, there's several reasons why you can't run everything in the cloud. Um, there's the first one that people are facing is autonomy issues. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a retail store, you can't put your point of sale system entirely in the cloud. If, if you've got to still sell pizzas and, and t-shirts, even when there's no net, network connectivity. Um, factories also face an issue of autonomy, right? You've got to have the factory run. Uh, then there's security issues. The data is too sensitive to move to the cloud. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's compliance issues, you know, uh, personal identifying information, video processing, bandwidth issues. The data is just too big to move there, which leads to cost issues. It's just too costly to do it. Um, and there's other reasons as well. And some companies face many of these reasons simultaneously. But really what's happened is um, we're seeing two different reasons for edge computing right now. And it will evolve over time. We're still at the beginning. Um, the one is they have all this IoT data that they can't economically move to the cloud. And so it's just falling on the ground. Mm -hmm. So how do I take advantage of that data? Edge computing. You've got to bring the cloud to the edge. The other one is companies modernize their software. Um, they made it cloud centric. They made it in containers. They made it to run on Kubernetes. And now they realize it can't run in the cloud it has to run on-prem, but I can't go back to the way it was before. I can't just buy a, a, a simple tower and put it in the back office. I need complex clustered infrastructure to run the software. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. So those are the things that we're solving for. Very interesting. How is the transition, say if they're using the cloud, how is the transi transition to edge um, computing? Is it a smooth transition? Is it something that takes quite a lot of time? How does it work? Well, it's hard for them because they try to take a traditional approach. They try to go back to the way things were back in the 1990s uh -huh. or, or 2000s, mm -hmm. where you, you buy the hardware, you send a technician out to install it, you manually install the software there, and it's a nightmare and it doesn't scale. Um, and, you know, it takes a trained technician four hours to install a Kubernetes cluster. And if you're dealing with a thousand stores, this suddenly becomes a big problem. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that the, that's a big problem is there's just not enough talented people out there. Every company is struggling to hire DevOps engineers, Kubernetes experts, et cetera. And they, have, they can maybe have enough to handle if it's centralized in their cloud infrastructure or their data center, but supporting it at thousands of locations, nobody has an army like that. Mm -hmm. And so how we solved for it is to make it to where a pizza delivery guy can install a Kubernetes cluster. That's where the simplicity has to be in order for this thing to scale. So it's, it's really all about scale. And until you solve the simplicity problem as we have, it's going to be unsolvable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting there. So um, the approach has to be 
kind of a modern day approach yeah not not this kind of um well this backdated way of thinking of the installation process yeah it's something that is completely modern day and it has to be how do you how do you approach that then if people have got this mindset is it just something that they've got to learn or something how do they go about learning this approach this difference well uh it's it's really about making them aware of us and and, and, and building awareness that there is a different way right because everyone else is either assuming you have to go back to the way things were in the 1990s or they're trying to shoehorn um solutions designed for the data center to mm -hmm. the edge mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's so typical. It's, it's human nature to generals fight the last war, right? Which means they apply the solutions to the previous challenge without adaptation to the new challenge. Yeah. So mm -hmm. cloud was the latest challenge. So let's say, oh, we'll just take this cloud hardware and software and just ship it out to the edge. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You have to start with a clean sheet of paper. You have to put all the assumptions on the page and come up with something that's designed for what you're solving for. It's it's very much like, it's not by coincidence that we call them software architects, mm -hmm. right? Or solutions architects, because it's that's what a, a real architect that designs buildings does. He starts with a blank sheet of paper and he talks about what is this building for and what is its environment? It doesn't just lift a building and a, a, a good architect, doesn't take a building that he designed over here and just drop it here. He starts from scratch and he, mm -hmm. he designs something that's organic to the problem he's solving for. And, and that's what's required. And that's what we haven't seen others do yet. Very interesting. We're going to come on to uh, staffing in a bit and hiring, because obviously, as you said, that is a problem for, um, well, all of us out there. Um, but before we do, we're going to take it back a little bit to more of the beginning days. Tell me, how did you approach your MVP in development? How did you work around this? Well, we bootstrapped ourselves. Um, I We went to, I can't say I, we, I've always had partners. Um, we went to venture capital and angel capital to fund it. Mm -hmm. And there reaction was nobody nobody will start a hardware company nobody's going to invest in a hardware company and we tried hard to explain it uh we're not a hardware company we're a software company that just happens to come in a a candy like yellow shell of a box mm -hmm. um and and the first thing i would say to co-founders out there is that's your problem it's not the investor's problem it's not the investor's problem to figure out what you're doing and why you're doing it. You have to work on your message. And one of my mentors told me that, um, as I, I, that I met along the way, that you're going to have to pitch 50 to 100 times before you figure out how to actually convey that message. Mm -hmm. And that was a horrifying realization for me. Um, but it turned out to be true. And it's just the nature of it. it. You just have to learn how to communicate your story effectively. So was it that many kind of attempts, the 50 to 100 kind of attempts of pitching? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. So it's not an easy journey. It, um, it's the, so we bootstrapped ourselves um, by helping companies adopt technology, uh, distributed technology. Um, and we took the profits and we, put it into building the MVP. Mm -hmm. um, and what we did was we picked a trade show. We went to Strata in New York and put the prototypes there at a booth to show the world what we built. And, and the whole thing was at that point, several years ago, just getting started, we were at an existential crisis. We said, okay, we know there's a niche in the market, but is there a market in the niche? And that's what we were there to find out. Mm -hmm. And the market screamed back, yes. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a resounding shout. Yes, there is a much bigger market that you ever imagined here. Mm -hmm. And so from there, we doubled down and pushed forward. And is being kind of on that 
sl well, that slope, that hill upwards ever since, I guess, yeah? So as you're saying, it's developing, it's getting faster, more and more companies will be requiring edge computing. I actually read some research earlier. It says, I've got it here, just to see if I can remember exactly. So there was one report published in October, 2021, uh, predicting that edge computing market, uh, the market of edge uh, computing will grow from the already sizable $36.5 billion in 2021 to 87.3 billion by 2026. And I guess maybe that's give or take, but this is huge. With this in mind, how are you going to approach that as a company? Will you be looking to outsource more staff um, to be able to cope with the influx of the challenges with that? Uh, yes, so we were lucky in the founding. One of my co-founders is um, from Ukraine mm -hmm. and uh, he had actually run uh, my development team when I was working on Wall Street. Uh, so a Wall Street bank had built an outsourced team or found an outsourced team in Ukraine. And when I was starting HiveCell, I knew I would not be able to afford the talent I needed onshore to build what we we're doing. So Vladimir uh, built us a, a an engineering team, a wholly owned subsidiary in Lviv, Ukraine. And the majority of our, our team is there. Mm -hmm. um, but even being in Ukraine with a wholly owned subsidiary, we struggled to get talent, right? Because it, no matter where you are, you're going to be competing against others that are looking for that world-class talent. Um, and there has been a substantial um, inflation in the salaries you have to pay in Ukraine over the past five years, to the point where other markets, even Canada, are comparable. Um, so mm -hmm. you, but you have to find the talent where you can find it. You have to be willing to have people work remote, but you also want to have wherever you can, th these pockets of teams that you can put to work. And so, and those pockets may be owned or they may be within a, um, a reliable, um, vendor. And so, and to scale, you definitely have to be able to get those teams onboarded um, as fast as possible where you can find them. So mm -hmm. yeah, there, it, without question, you have to do outsourcing. You also have to outsource manufacturing. So with our hardware, um, we do have that outsourced as well in the mm -hmm. United States, just world-class. Mm -hmm. And the faculty there are amazing. Um, my team has actually uh, done adjunct uh, classes there. Uh, we've been invited to teach the students. Cool. Um, so it's a two-way street there, the community. Um, th there's something about the education and the environment and the culture of Ukraine that just produces world-class engineers. Um, and one of the ways I sum this up is in other cultures, um, the engineers are very quick to say, yes, we can do this. And you have to push very hard um, to figure out what are the actual challenges because they brush over them. And, and the project actually can go off the rails and stagnate and you can go six months and then realize there's some fundamental flaws in what we're doing and how we're doing it. Mm -hmm. In Ukraine, they always start with no, it can't be done. And, um, and then you have to identify the things that will make it feasible. And you have to go, you have to work to yes. Um, but what happens there is it's, it's a very honest discussion and it's actually a much faster path to a solution. So you can trust your engineering team a lot more in that kind of environment. You know what the risks are, you know, what's feasible and what's not feasible, um, which you're not going to get if an engineering team just says yes and hides that from you because you've already gone through those stages of what will be the problems perhaps what will they will face which they're not sure how to be able to um, overcome these problems but actually as you said by working from that no to the yes they've already got a plan of action of how to kind of solve everything exactly. opposed from the opposite so 
obviously it has to be spoken about with the war we're obviously based um in ukraine well some of our uh, engineers are based in ukraine as well with the war um has started obviously two months now have gone past a little bit over how has that affected um the flow of work has it affected at all how have your developers your engineers um coped with this task have they continued to work have they moved what have they done to be able to cope with this well, we looked at it strategically, and that's why we started in Lviv uh, for the very geopolitical risks that were there um, and not in Kyiv or, or elsewhere. Um, we did, as we grew, open another office, a second office in Kyiv, um, but we had contingency plans in place. So when the war started, we moved all of our employees um, who were either remote or in Kyiv uh, to Lviv mm -hmm. and were able to do it very quickly. Um, the first two weeks, the first week we shut down entirely. We said, take care of your family. So uh, one of the principles of our company is family first. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second week um, we told the employees, you can come in to work if you want, or you can go do volunteer work. And I'd say at least half or more uh, spent their time doing volunteer work at that beginning of the war. Um, about the third week, it almost went to normalcy. And now what we see is people are in the office every day and uh, productivity is just as good as, as it's ever been. And the message um, from uh, co-founder Vladimir Kondratenko to the employees is we have to win the war front. The best thing you can do for Ukraine in this war right now is to keep the economy going, mm -hmm. do your job, make a paycheck, pay your taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have one or two employees volunteer for the army. Um, and, um, and we, and, and we, our message to him was, you know, follow your conscience, do what you think you need to do. We're here to support you. Amazing. You know, it is this way. I, I'm British, but obviously being in Ukraine, I've lived in Ukraine for the last few years. It is this kind of, it was the first kind of two weeks of craziness. And then Ukrainians just kept their head down and worked. And for them, work is so important. And when people say, has it kind of the level of what is expected gone down, I would say, if anything, it's gone up, if it is possible, just because yep. they know the importance of it. Okay, talking about uh, talking about your team here, then talking about, obviously, earlier, we were saying about the difficulty of finding great engineers, how does hive sale how do you go about doing it these days how can you find these engineers and actually scoop them up instead of them going for a bigger company a company maybe that offers more money what is your strategy here well we take a a couple of approaches first off um we invest very much in the culture of the office um, we have our own building there in lviv uh, that we've invested in the aesthetics of it so we try to create an environment that is um you know better than than others right some place that you want to work and, and a team that you want to work with uh second um we uh we're a very open company uh we we want people to know what's going on where we are with things uh have them participating in the strategy in the decision making process um, third, we give everyone equity, uh, which is mm -hmm. apparently not very common um, for Ukraine. So everyone coming in gets equity in the company, uh, just like you would in the U.S. in a startup. Um, but that said, it's, um, you know, a startup is a risk, right? So um, what you'll find is some engineers and other talent, because it's not just engineers that we are there. Um, some seek out that risk and some um, avoid it. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> there's some talent you're just not going to get because of the risk threshold. Um, it's, um, but I'd say our turnover has been, um, has been good. So in that we haven't had very high turnover. Mm -hmm. 
that was actually leads me on to one of my next questions with obviously we're talking about um some basically the risk some people thrive on the risk some people don't thrive on the risk of a startup do you believe that it takes a certain type of person then to work in a startup or can anyone learn to work in a startup i think they have to be able to accept risk uh -huh. um the um because startups have up and ups and downs uh, they have um crises they have um good times they have the wins they have the losses right mm -hmm. and i think people just by their nature are will thrive in that uh some of them will be able to tolerate it and some of them will not be able right. to tolerate it. they really fall into three buckets there and so uh and some of them um like the idea but once they're there they realize they don't like the idea mm -hmm. and so uh they they will choose to leave um and uh, going back to you know our principal family first um if you're married uh it's not just your risk it's your wife's risk as well and she or he your spouse have to be uh comfortable with that risk as well so all of that comes into play and if you're you know a lot of our employees are in their 20s um just starting out their families um and this is all new to them so we try to counsel them on that so mm -hmm. interesting so you kind of got this very strong kind of connection strong well how to say you've obviously got your team in Lviv as well so you've got the ability to be kind of hands on deck with them yeah to make sure everything is going well to be very supportive of them family first this obviously goes throughout the whole of hive cell what kind of um what advice obviously you're you're there in the states is it new york you're, you're located in? i'm in the hudson valley of new york yes okay so what would uh, be your advice to uh, other founders who are looking to manage an offshore team do you uh, have much contact obviously with them on a daily basis a weekly basis how does it work for you what would be the best advice well the first advice would be um you got to have somebody the lead there that you can trust explicitly uh -huh. um so find that partner either it's a manager in an outsourcing company or it's your own partner but you need someone there that you can trust that you can communicate completely openly with the second thing is um, visit as often as you can mm -hmm. um, when before the war uh, i was going over at least once a quarter to spend two weeks there um uh, other partner uh was there half the year oh. um, he would spend half his time in ukraine um and get the team over to the states that's also an, a key part of it so it can't just be one way you it, get the engineers and other team members that are in ukraine or offshore anywhere to the states or to europe wherever your headquarters are so it has to be a cross pollination um why is that so important is it important for like the the passion for what you're doing as a company it's I call it seeing the elephant, right? Um, you just, until you're there, you're just making assumptions. And there's every single time, there's always an aha moment. They're like, oh, that's what's going on. Oh, that's who these guys are. Oh, that's what the problem is. Um, oh, that's what you're dealing with. Both ways, both on the customer side, on the domestic side and on the offshore side. So um, you just, we project, we, we just, make assumptions um, that we are not even aware of until we're actually there on the ground. So um, that that's really what it comes down to, just getting rid of unspoken, unaware assumptions on both sides. Uh, let's go on. We're going to talk a little bit more about edge computing. So um, Edge computing obviously has its downsides, like security breach, uh, vulnerability, physical maintenance and management, time and cost, maybe connective, uh, connectivity issues. What do you think of them and how are you at HiveSale tackling these? Do you agree? Does it? 
Well, first I would say that and security is, is paramount in the thoughts of our customers um, with Edge. And I would say that, again, going back to the blank sheet of paper, the security threat of Edge is very different than the security threat of cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a completely different attack plane. So with Edge, the way we do it, you have a thousand attack points can possibly, but every one of them is only an inch deep, right? If you breach that one, you end up with a set of data that's probably meaningless in value you know, without any value mm -hmm. to whoever's hacking it. You know, the, the vibration data off of a, a dynamo, you know, um, the, the transactions of a single store. Um, the, and of course we deal with, you know, data is encrypted at rest, data is encrypted in motion, uh, security key rotation, all the things that you do, right? There's, we know, how, professionals know how to secure a system, right? It's not like we just throw all that stuff out the window. Cloud has a very small attack surface, but it's a mile deep, right? Once they're there, they're in everything, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a different way of thinking about security that has to be done uh, for edge. Um, so would you mean say like, it's got lots of, a lot more layers before it can get to any of the meaningful stuff, edge computing? Well, it's, it becomes, if, if it's done right, it becomes compartmentalized, right? Um, a single node does not compromise you. Mm -hmm. um, or a handful of nodes, right? But because, and, and also they would have to hack every single node in order to do anything, right? Whereas in the cloud or in a data center, once they are breached, they're on the right. inside of the firewall and the, you know, it's an open plane, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's just, a, it just has to be thought about differently. You can't, again, going back to fighting the last war, you cannot just take how you think about security in the cloud or the data center and slap it on edge. Mm -hmm. um, but networking is a very key part of the edge. And, and the, again, going back to how is it different, the network that an edge application has to deal with is so different than the network that a data center works with. And you know, we, nobody would design, we design for a server failing. In, in the data center. Server fails, we have resilience, we have redundancy, the applications are respawn on our server. But we don't have all of a sudden the, all the IP addresses would change. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. We don't have that, um, uh, we would suddenly lose network and, and, and then have it again. We don't assume that it's behind a firewall that we don't control. So there's a lot more to it than, it, it's a different animal, let's say that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Different animal, nice quote there. Uh, what about, okay, so how should a company approach ed, uh, edge uh, strategy? So, and understand kind of when it's time to start using edge. For example, here at Relevant, we have, uh, we specialize in IoT uh, software development and recently had a client that was asking, well, it needed a system to manage wind turbines. How should we approach this decision, decision when making this decision about edge computing implementation? Well, first off, um, you're not gonna be able to just move all the raw data to the cloud mm -hmm. and process it there. It's just going to be impractical. So that means you have to process the raw data at the source and then send only the business relevant data to the cloud. And the ratio of that is starts at 401 and goes much up, right? The raw data is meaningless to anyone. If you're monitoring the vibration of a dynamo, at a thousand Hertz, there's no business value to that data, right? All you wanna know is, is it vibrating normally or abnormally? And when you compare that binary number to the vibration data, it, it's a huge difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, plus you need to be able to know whether it's vibrating normally or abnormally, whether you have network connectivity or not, right? So you may need to shut down that dynamo. It's business important to know that happened, but it's even more important to save the dynamo. I can, I can, and headquarters find out 
five minutes or five days later that it was shut down. Hopefully it doesn't take that long, but but that you get the point there. Mm-hmm. So you're going to have to move the compute to the source. Um, the second thing is you need to start, you need to start now, you need to start small and you need to scale quickly. So you do not have to put in a hundred thousand dollar server at those locations like other companies are telling you. You do not need to take data center hardware and put it at the edge. Mm-hmm. Um, you do not need uh, a 72 core server at the edge like you have in the data center. Mm-hmm. You need an eight core server, but you need three of them, right? And you need, there's this concept of thinking in edge scale um, that we talk about. That if I have 72 core server or 96 core server and I have a hundred of them in my data center, that's a lot of horsepower, right? But when think about the numbers, right? That's about 10,000 cores of processing that I have. If I take that same 96 core server and I put one of them at a thousand locations, right? That's overkill. That's mm-hmm. so much compute power. What I really, but if I put three, three eight core computers there at the edge at a thousand locations, the, the, the engineers that are in the data center go, what are you possibly going to do with 24 cores? Well, the fact is the loads that you're dealing with, the load is not concentrated. You're not dealing with this data of a thousand locations. You're dealing with the data of one location. Mm-hmm. And so the workload is not the same as the data center. And if I try to take data center hardware, data center software, and put it at the edge, it's like trying to drive a tack nail with a sledgehammer. Um, but when I, and plus when you add it all up, it's a lot of, of, of infrastructure. So start small. Um, your edge deployment should be the smallest possible size necessary to do the work now. Show that return on investment and then scale it up um, wow. as you add more workloads. And you will. That's the other thing. Whatever you're doing at the edge now is only the beginning. It's going to grow and grow and grow. It's going to grow exponentially. Mm-hmm. So anticipate scale. So put the smallest, but don't buy that hundred thousand dollar server and say oh in five years from now it will we'll have a workload big enough for this that's not how any sane company does return on investment these days right so just put small machines in there and anticipate you're going to have to scale it so they really need to companies really need to start making that kind of self-education about what is and how it can help um, edge computing otherwise they're going to be spending so much time money and effort on Kind of something that's not going to work if they don't use edge computing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We we come into customer after customer who assume they could process all of their IoT in the cloud, and it's like the 1950s sitcom where the dad builds the boat in the garage and then mm-hmm. he can't get the boat out of the garage, mm-hmm. right? And so that's what we're seeing again and again. Um, we're also seeing companies that say, "Oh no, I can do it edge, but I'm going to home grow it." Hey, Kubernetes is open source. I can put this stuff together. And then they realize once they get to the 10th or 20th location, they can't manage it. They can't scale it. Mm -hmm. It's edges, scale, scale, scale. You have, and it's a different way of thinking about scale. Um, Okay, good. So uh, just to finish off, just got two more questions or so here. These ones are more about kind of your challenges and a little bit more personal towards you and your, um, your experience. So, what has I've seen um, on your LinkedIn, you were uh, serving in the military for, I think, 10 years, it said, serving in the military for 10 years. How has that kind of experience and leadership really influenced on the leadership that you were providing now at HypeSail? Well, there's no greater institution for teaching, studying and fostering leadership than the United States Army. Um, and it, it has been invaluable to me. Mm. Um, and it does definitely translate into, uh, corporations into the corporate world. It's, it's fundamental principles such as, um, 
a leader takes ownership for all that goes wrong and gives the praise for all that goes right to his team. Okay. Um, it's uniformity of command, having one person in charge of each problem. Um, for any problem, there is one and only one person who has ultimate uh, responsibility for it. Um, it's, so many of these principles uh, translate, all of them I think do. Um, it's also helped me in thinking about how we go to market, how we deal with strategy. Um, I use metaphors uh, all the time, such as a Calvary. The one that screen. reminded me about it yeah. was the uh, the general's last war. You know yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's, I'll talk about doing a cavalry screen on the market. Right, you're you you're spreading yourself thin and wide, looking for that opportunity. But once you find it, you concentrate everything on that one thing and you push forward. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you hear people talk about it in startups all the time, but for me, it's it's the same as uh, well. That's a cavalry screen and a and a and a and a breach, right? So, mm -hmm. um, just different environment. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, my career with the military, I was in the reserves as a as a cavalry officer, but I also worked in defense research as a civilian, mm -hmm. and that also. Um, uh, had a, a big impact to being at the very beginning of my career, working on some amazing projects. I was in the supercomputing program for for the Pentagon, and mm -hmm. and uh, my mentor, uh, General Minnis, telling me, oh, his mantra to me was, "You're not thinking big enough." Uh -huh. And no matter what I brought to him, he, he was the response was always, "You're not thinking big enough," and just that pushing yourself to think bigger um, was was formed there. Mm -hmm. so. And has that been something that you've used with Hive Cell? You're not thinking big enough? Yes, yes it is. I, I, I'm, uh, I, I try to push my engineers and, and, my, and my architects and my UX designers to say, you know, you're not thinking new enough. You're not thinking novel enough. You're not uh, you're not pushing it far enough, right? Is there something better out there? Is there something else that we could be doing? Mm -hmm. um, and they've, I don't know if there is. I'm just asking the question. I'm, I'm just being that. Um, Makes people think, doesn't it? And that's what it needs to be. And, and they always mm -hmm. surprise me. They always blow me away with what they mm -hmm. come back with. So it, that I'm now at that point where I'm not inventing the things. I'm creating an environment in which things can be invented. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What has um, been the uh, challenges? Okay, so challenges. What has been the kind of biggest challenge that you have faced at Hive Cell? And how have you overcome it? Or are you still overcoming it? Obviously saying that it's, you know. We, we are overcoming it. So the, the biggest challenge we've faced is um, being weak on the sales and go-to-market side. Okay. Um, I, my, myself, am an engineer. My, both my co-founders are engineers. And as a result, we have been lopsided. As a CEO, there are three cultures that you have to balance within a company, within a startup. There's the engineering, the research and development side, which is its own culture. There's the operations side, beans and bullets, payroll, keeping the money. Um, um, and then third is the sales and marketing side. And there are three different cultures and they're like three legs of a stool. And if, if one of them's too strong or too weak, you're going to fall over. Mm -hmm. um, and the key there is to reach out and find the partners that have the, the skill sets that you need to shore up the, your side of the weakness and, and trust them to do what it is they do. Mm -hmm. They're there because they're different than you. And they're going to think differently than you do. And they, they're going to act differently than you do. And that's a good thing because mm -hmm. they're doing the things that you cannot do. 
And so, but in order to have that, there's got to be a serious amount of trust, right? Um, so finding really competent, and, and that really That's is difficult, the that single is. largest um, challenge of any startup mm -hmm. is finding enough competent leaders. If you can find the competent leaders, you will get the competent team because competent people will not tolerate working for incompetent leaders. They'll go someplace else. Everyone leaves a job because of their boss. Mm -hmm. 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So if you can get, if, if I could find 12 competent world-class executives, I could conquer the world. But Jesus Christ himself couldn't get 12 competent people, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it's find that team that you can trust that's competent and, and, and really things thing. take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a, uh, the thing that reminded me of if it's on the three legs and it's not even, as, as you said, it's going to fall over. So you need to find those things that, um, as you said, complement each other and able to, when you don't know something, someone else does. When they don't know, you know. How you look at it, you may see one way, but they may see it in, in a different light, which is something that makes it thrive. Um, last question. Uh, so the, last, the reason why it's so hard to get those 12 leaders is because anybody that you, could, you, that you want can start their own company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so getting people that are willing to join forces, each one of them could be running their own company, but getting them all to join forces in a single company, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Uh -huh. Okay. And last one for you. Um, I always like to finish on this question for our podcast because obviously lots of different experience. What is the best piece of advice you have ever been given or you can actually share with our listeners, other tech founders out there? What is the best bit of advice you could give? How could you make your startup, your company, your business thrive? I think that the, the, I've had lots of great mentors and, um, and, and that's absolutely key to anyone's success. Mm -hmm. um, you're not born a leader. You, you, you're, you have to learn. Yeah. And you learn from others uh, that are good leaders. But when I was commissioned uh, a second lieutenant in, in the cavalry, um, one of my mentors said to me, um, don't be General Grant. Don't be General Patton. Be General Ricker. Mm -hmm. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to figure out who you are as a leader and be true to your strengths and weaknesses. You can learn from as many people as you want, but at the end of the day, it's, it's you in the front of the room. It's, it's that has to motivate a group of men and women to sign on to your crazy idea and and tie their fortunes to it absolutely mm -hmm. and you know that lieutenant grant may not be able to work with the let's say 10 people you've got in front of you lieutenant <laughs> ricker may be able to it's about uh, i think that's one amazing thing isn't it that everyone's got the chance to do in this every bit of experience you've got in the past everyone you meet everyone that's inspired you you can take a bit from everyone and then create yourself to well not even create yourself develop yourself with this knowledge that you've got on top of your shoulders to move it forwards really and to put it a slightly more uh effective way for the audience is don't be the next apple don't be the next google be hive cell mm -hmm. be who you are you're the next and you're only going to be the next by being you and not trying to be them mm -hmm. Very nice, very nice way to finish as well, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I just want to say absolutely. I think we've taken we've taken far more time than than I planned. So that's amazing. So thank you so much for giving us your time and your expertise. And I am sure uh, all of our listeners will absolutely love to listen to this episode of Relevant Founders. So thank you. No, thank you for the opportunity. Hey guys. 
I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to press the thumbs up button below. Also, subscribe to our channel to make sure you don't miss out on any future content coming your way in the near future. Also, I really want to know your opinion about this episode, so be sure to leave a comment down below in the comment section. Okay guys, that's all for now. See you soon.